I'm delighted to be here today um, as a director of Abu Dhabi Art, which is organized by the Department of Culture and Tourism Abu Dhabi, uh, on the occasion of our first exhibition abroad for three phenomenal UAE artists um, as part of our program Beyond Emerging Artists. As an annual art fair, uh, we usually take place at Minarita Sadiat in Abu Dhabi every year. Last year, of course, we were virtual. The one thing we insisted on doing um, was commissioning artists to create new work because it was all the more important uh, in a time of lockdown and artists working from studios at home that we gave them the opportunity to still create and produce new work. Um, each year we invite a guest curator to work with the three artists um, in the development of these works. And last year we were honoured and thrilled when Maya accepted, Maya Al Khalil who's sitting here on my right, uh, to be the curator for Beyond Emerging Artists 2020. And as part of that role, she uh, gave them critical feedback, developed their ideas with them, um, exchanged ideas, debated, uh, a lot of it over Zoom because of these strange conditions of lockdown. Um, and at the end of it all, they created works that were shown in Abu Dhabi um, at Minarita Sadiat. <coughs> because of the um, uh, pandemic, we didn't have a fair and they didn't have the usual number of visitors seeing the work. And that's what really uh, gave fruit to the idea that we should take the works overseas and bring it to a wider audience, which is how we came to um, connect with Cromwell Place. It also so happened that four of our galleries that regularly do the fair were members at Cromwell Place. Um, and so here joining us as part of this panel discussion um, is Tabari Art Space <laughs> and, and uh, Laurie Shabibi. Um, both galleries are showing works by Emirati artists, um, Tabri Art Space, a phenomenal emerging artist, and Laurie Shabibi, one of the pioneers of the UAE art scene. And this is a collaborative effort between us and them, and also, of course, Third Line Gallery and Isabel van der Neind, um, to allow insights into the thriving UAE contemporary art scene today um, through showcasing some of their works. So to begin with, I'm going to ask uh, Maya to tell us a little bit more about the program Beyond Emerging Artists that took place uh, last year and the works that you'll be able to see um, upstairs in the Wing Gallery afterwards. Um, so Maya, of course, you know, you're a uh, curator and a writer and um, formerly the director of the Arthur Gallery in Saudi Arabia, where you worked a lot with emerging artists um, and had the opportunity to help them develop their works. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what drew you to the three artists that you chose to work with last year, what you especially liked about each of their works? Tell us a little bit more about the artists um, that were chosen for the program. Thank you, Diala, for having me. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here, and it's, it's an amazing opportunity to be talking about uh, these three amazing artists. Um, yes, it is beyond emerging artists, but actually their practice is quite more complex than being fit into whether emerging or more established artists because some of them are younger in their practice and others have been, um, there are teachers, uh, assistant prof, one of them, Afra Dahri, is an assistant professor at Sheikh Zayed University. Um, uh, Hind Mezaina, I mean, she's been uh, a commentator of the scene. She founded, um, what was it called? <laughs> No, not not half. Uh, and she founded, yeah, the culture, the culturist, which is a blog, a fantastic blog, commenting on the art scene in the UAE since uh, 2009. So, and a photographer, and recently have uh, started working with film. And the younger one is Afra Swedi, who's um, who was doing her residency at the Cultural Foundation in Abu Dhabi. So their practice is is quite varied in in. Um, uh, in, in the way they're, um, in the lengths in, uh, they've been practicing, but also in the way they approach the topics. But what was interesting for all of, for the three of them, is that they're talking um, about the past. So they're really addressing themes of memory. And for me, I found it um, interesting in a country that's really um, looking forward. It's like we're always this feeling of, of uh, of a present that is, that is happening too fast. And, uh, and for these youngsters, that uh, their, their generation have seen so many changes in a very short period of time. And for them, as, uh, at their age, to be looking 
at the past and really looking at concepts of memory, concept of, uh, for Hint Mezena, concept of collective memory, and trying to maybe make sense of, uh, um, of um, the events and really record it and archive it in a way. That, for me, was fascinating. Thank you. Um, we'll come back to looking at those artists' works in more depth, but maybe I'm going to ask um, Laura next, who is, of course, um, the d uh, director at Tuberi Art Space, but also doing a PhD at SOAS, um, which, is, which sounds fascinating, so I encourage you to corner her afterwards and ask her about that. Um, and uh, Laura, Tuberi Art Space is showing Meitha Abdullah, who... Um, you know, you could also think of as emerging, although as, as Maya points out, those are very sort of tricky terms to, to work with. Um, Maitha's work in some way um, reflects on childhood memories, so there's perhaps a nice link there um, if, if we think about that idea of, of memory. Um, can you tell us more about what her works explore, more about her practice? Um, yeah, sure. So a lot of her work is also rooted in memory, um, faith-based tradition and folklore as well in theater and performance. And this body of work is called Scars by Daylight, and it's exploring the notion of adolescence. So the works are rooted in the bathroom and the bedroom, which are very kind of intimate spaces where the idea of adolescence is most pronounced, um, and where you kind of reflect and you're alone with yourself. Um, and in terms of, um, sorry, blank. <laughs> I think it's actually quite interesting that you, that you point out the performative element of her works, um, because she does do a lot of sort of performative Work, performance work as well, doesn't she? Or she has props. Can you tell us more about those? Yeah, so um, she, the characters that she, you can see in this body of work are the pig and the rooster. Um, so going back to faith-based tradition and memory. So the pig is the embodiment of sin, whereas the rooster is its dual opposite, and the rooster embodies purity. And you can see in the photographic works that she's created the props, um, the pig's head and the rooster's beak as well. Thank you very much. And then we'll, we'll touch now... Um, Asma, of course, um, is the founder, co-founder um, of Laurisha Bibi, and we're delighted that you've brought, um, you know, really one of the sort of pioneering artists of the UAE, Mohammed Ahmed Ibrahim, Thanks. here, and, and decided to showcase his works. Um, I think you could say um, that some of his works also draw on um, memories of Khulfa Khan, of things that, of the landscape around him. Could you tell us a little bit more about that as a sort of starting point to the work? Yeah, so um, Muhammad was born in 1962, so he's about 59 years old, and um, he lives in a, a coastal town called Khorfa Khan, um, which has the sea, but also has a, a very rugged terrain of the Khajar Mountains. Um, it's quite uh, rough, I would say. I mean, it's, it's sort of very rocky. And um, in the 80s, he would spend a lot of time in sort of long walks and hikes, um, you know, picking stones, picking things that he would find, and then using them to make to make art. Although he didn't realize what he was doing, so he's not a trained artist. Um, in the 80s, he hooked up with the late Hassan Sharif, and Hassan Sharif was like, "You're making conceptual art." Um, so it kind of sta started from that, and him and Hassan were very close, um, and Hassan was a very sort of important mentor to to Muhammad. Um, and so in the terms of yeah, so what we bought, we, we, he's a very prolific artist and he does, he works um, quite obsessively on certain series. So it could be the line, it could be certain symbols, all of which are sort of um, representative of things that he sees um, in Khorfa Khan. Um, so we bought um, a few works in paper mache, um, dating from 2017 to 2019, um, which is what we're showing here. And I was very interested by, um you know, when I asked you the other day about why he um, started introducing colour into his sculptures, yeah. um, and you mentioned something about the sunset. Could you maybe tell us about that? Yeah, so um, it, the thing about uh, Muhammad is I, I really understood his work when I visited him in his studio, and it's, I think it's really important that for anyone to, to sort of really understand what he does is to pay a visit. But it's a coastal town, and then there's a very sort of big, sort of rugged mountain, which is right behind his studio and where he lives. Um, and throughout his childhood, um, this, these mountains would block the sunset. So he never experienced this kind of bright, you know, the oranges and the reds and the color that we see until much later in life. And um, for him, it was this 
when he first experienced it, he wanted to sort of recreate it. And it stayed in his mind's eye for many years, and then he started to introduce um, colored paper in his work. Um, so you see, like, at the beginning, he does a lot of more natural colors, black and white, um, and then he moves on to these very bright, vibrant colors. Um, the paper mache is actually... Um, all the papers are natural, so he's not painting any of the papers. So if you see his works, a lot of people think he's created the form and then painted the lines on top of it. But actually, he's, um, he's, they're kind of painterly sculptures. He uses the paper um, and then sort of adds, adds it onto the sculptures. So the paper is the original color, if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, completely. So I think it's, in a way, quite interesting. I, mean, I don't want to oversimplify it, but you could say that, um, you know, for artists that have seen rapid transformation and urbanization and sort of lands landscapes um, becoming more and more built up, um, you know, there's a sort of sense of wanting to protect or preserve or, you know, mine um, that heritage and landscape, you know, before it sort of transforms um, beyond recognition in a way. Um, and I think it's quite interesting that artists are quite aware of, of that kind of transformation that's happening. And so, for example, if we go back to our emerging artists, um, we have someone like Hind Mizena, who is a, um, I mean, you could call her a sort of visual anthropologist. She kind of um, looks at a changing history of um, dance in the context of masculinity um, with her work, which is a video work um, you'll, you'll find in the second floor. I wonder, Maya, if you could tell us a bit about that. Yes, it's actually interesting because the way that Hind describes it, it's a, um, it started off by seeing this uh, clip, this sh a clip of a disco competition uh, that was going, I mean, maybe only three years ago, that was really um, uh, going online. And she's, uh, uh, it's about a disco competition, a world disco competition that happened in London in 1980. And one of the protagonists, one of the participants was somebody from the UAE. And for her, it was, it, it, it was striking to, to really to try to understand what does it mean to win a competition, to represent, um, uh, to represent the nation, to represent the country at a time. And if that uh, dancer had won, uh, would it be, how would it be seen? Is it, is, it, is it something that you would be celebrated at the national level? Is it how would it be? understood disco at the time in the, in the 80s very much very different than and now what how how would society look at this so for Hind it's um, it's it's really trying to um, to tap into events and how events are recorded and how events are are, are interpreted but also how how things could be stereotyped from the outside but also what is what is done within 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 the community to either reinforce or break these stereotypes? So, in fact, how things are interpreted at the collective level. Um, I think you know, in a way, Hind is a really interesting artist to start with in that sense that she is able to sort of take a step back from within that society. That is her, you know, it's her country, it's her community, and sort of say this is what's changed over the decades. Um, you know, in the 1980s, disco was something that was exciting and that was explored um, uh, in, the, you know, in the context of dance. Today, maybe less so. Uh, did you want to add yes, something to no, that? Yes, no, because yeah. it, she reinforces the idea that there's a lot of things to be celebrated, but they are forgotten. Mm. So there's a lot of, because, because of these rapid changes, this younger generation is not, maybe is not recording or is not looking back at events that, that for her are worth talking about, are worth delving into, are worth even being celebrated. And perhaps in a way, you know, that's what artists are uniquely placed to do, um, you know, whether it's to bear witness to or to document or to sometimes throw up in the light, um, you know, sort of thoughts or traditions or ideas that a whole community hold dear and celebrate, um, or sometimes that, that, you know, what their fears are or, or what their concerns are. And so perhaps in the case of Mather's work, um, you know, you could say that what she's really inviting us to think about is some of those old folkloric tales, um, you know, that, that she grew up on. Can you tell us more about, about that? Yeah, so um, the rooster in Mather's work, again, is it references a story her grandmother would tell her. So her granny would say to her, when you hear a rooster calling, it means that angels are close by. And so it's this idea of kind of, you know, an oral tradition of stories that are passed on orally, um, 
you know, some of which, because they're not captured, um, you know, could be forgotten by later generations. And it's quite important um, that as artists, they kind of mine that and, and, and incorporate that and include that. Um, and then, of course, we have someone like uh, Afrid Dahari, um, you know, who works very closely with hair. Um, but again, there's always, on the one hand, it, hair in the context of time and memory, and then on the other hand, um, in a wider context about, um, you know, hair as a, as a maker of identity. Um, I, I don't know if you could tell us a bit more about that. Yes, Afra also, uh, what, again, she goes back to her own experiences, her own stories. So Afra is, a, is, a, is an artist who's as, growing up has a very heavy hair, curly, heavy hair. And she always struggled, or her, her, mom, her mom struggled to really tame it, to really uh, braid it. And, uh, and for her, it, 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 was, it was a memory that uh, growing up really registered these, the, different, uh, the different phases in her life. And she talks about her as a container of memory, but not only as a container of memory, but also as, a, as, a, as, as weight. I mean, there is beyond the weight as a number uh, on a scale, there is also the weight of what it means within society. Uh, so what does, it, what does it mean when she has to braid it and, and tie it so that when she goes to the, out to the family, it's, it's, it's contained. What does it mean when you, have, when you veil it? Is it, part, is, it, is it an external element of the body or is it part of the body? Is it, uh, is it private or is it public? Um, so there, is, there are quite a lot of connotations of, um, and, and references to, uh, to society with how, how, how hair is interpreted as uh, um, as, as, yeah, as, a, uh, as, a, as feminism, as a symbol, of, uh, as a symbol for, uh, um, for private public. And uh, thinking about private public and, and the sort of uh, architectures of privacy, um, maybe we can touch on our third emerging artist, um, Afra Swedi, um, and her work Unsheltered, which is also um, showing in the Wing Gallery upstairs. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, yeah, Safra is our youngest artist, um, and she, she, while she was doing her residency at the Cultural Foundation, she started addressing themes of abuse, of violation, and, um, and she really wanted to be vocal about it. It's like she used the fact that she's an artist to very much raise the volume on, on topics that are starting to be addressed within, within uh, society, but not enough. And uh, so what she did is that listening to her community and listening to stories of, uh, of, uh, of abuse behind, behind doors, behind, so she uses element of architecture when, archi when, when trauma is happening behind uh, elements of architecture. So there is a lot, that, these are collages, and in these collages she uses material and uh, found objects that are usually within our our private space. So these are objects that are familiar. These are objects that are supposedly comforting. Uh, they're objects that are that exist within our within our childhood, like toys, like blankets, like. And she cuts and 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 burns and overlays these in a very in a, in a, almost in a violent way. Even the stitching. When you look at these collages with the stitching, you feel it's almost you feel the pain of a rough stitching. So there's a lot of pain there, there's a lot of emotion there, but there's also a lot of courage. Um, and, uh, and even the way that it is displayed, it's like you have, you, you almost want to go in between the frames, the metallic frames, but you're not able really to go through, but you peek through these frames. And uh, again, it's the concept of peeking through a private, private shelters that, that do not act as shelters anymore. And the three emerging artists, um, if we can call them that, you've corrected me on that, uh, the three artists that you know, participated in Beyond Emerging Artists um, you know, were part of a program that a few years ago was actually curated by um, Muhammad Ahmed Ibrahim. And um, he worked with three different artists and he actually brought them um, here to the UK and um, he wanted to go and see Stonehenge because he considered Stonehenge um, the sort of the first uh, land art uh, in the UK <laughs> and, um, and he recounted how when he was younger he was so desperate to come to the UK um, and to, to sort of see Stonehenge 
um, that he sort of joined um, the police force because he was told at the time that um, if he became a policeman, part of the training would involve a trip to the UK. And he thought, great, I'll go and see Stonehenge when I do that. And then sadly, he joined the police force and they changed the program and there was no trip to the UK. <laughs> so he had to slightly um, sort of backpedal out of that <laughs> and become a librarian as well. Um, and he then says he sort of, you know, he, uh, he started working in a library and had his studio below. Um, and, and so hidden away in this amazing library was, was an incredible um, studio of his works. Um, of course, things have changed since then, and you know, I think artists are able to, to focus a lot more on being artists and not having other jobs that help them. Um, and that's in part because of the growth of galleries, um, you know, in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. But um, especially you know, with Al Sirkal, I have to say, you know, it's become a really thriving hub. So Asma, I'm going to ask you just to tell everyone in a wider context about that sort of UAE art scene, um, about your gallery. Um, that you started with Will, who's over here, of course, um, and, and uh, you know, about how that all happened and about Al Sirkar, because I think it'd be interesting for people to know um, a little bit of that history. Yeah, well, um, so we established Loi Shwebi in 2010, 2011, it's been 10 years, um, and um, I think we were the maybe third gallery or fourth gallery to open um, in the warehouse district, so so at the time it really was um, it was warehouses. It was one of the few warehouses that were actually in a sort of lined district that where you could walk sort of between the warehouses. I think the first gallery there was Ayam, followed by Carbon Twelve, uh, then Isabel, then us. Um, so it's very grassroots. Nobody really knew where this place was. It wasn't really on Google Maps. I don't think we had Google Maps actually in 2011. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We guess I used to get lost going there as well. Um, you know, the whole thing was in the middle of a industrial zone, um, and uh, it sort of grew grew from that. Obviously, some of the galleries had already been running. I mean, I think um, Isabel had B21 for maybe three, four years before she relocated into that space. Um, so very grassroots and very much, you know, galleries doing their own thing. It wasn't really a community as such. I mean, we knew each other, but. The idea of a sort of, you know, Al Sarkal Avenue that it is today didn't really exist. Um, and then, sort of, within a few years, um, you know, Al Sarkal, his sort of management agent, let's call them, came around and were like, you know, we've noticed there are all these galleries here. Um, and, you know, is there anything that you need? Like, what's lacking? And we all were like, can we just have a coffee shop? <laughs> you know, somewhere to go and get lunch and coffee. Um, and then suddenly it, it was sort of was like, no, they're going to go and, and really focus on this as a, as a cultural, as a cultural district. district. Um, so then they made plans to extend the space. So we have the old section, which is where we're in. And now we have a newer section, which has incorporated more of the design, more restaurants, more, more exhibition spaces. And then over time, I think Elsa Karl created a foundation and basically do their own programming as well. So there is a space called Concrete, um, which is an exhibition space. They've shown a couple of museum type shows there. Um, and so they, so they run their own programming. We have our own sort of gallery openings and it's a bit more coordinated. I mean, when we did our openings the first couple of years, I'd walk over to Isabel and I'd be like, you know, are you opening something in March? Or, well, March would be, but let's say January. What dates? Let's open together. So we would start opening together and then others would sort of join in. Um, it took a while before there was a sort of a, a coordinating sort of role where, you know, now we get an email and it's like, when are your openings? When shall we open? When shall we do an art night? It's a lot more coordinated. Before it was very rudimentary. Um, and yeah, that's how it was really. But it's Started interesting out. you sort of say there wasn't so much of a community, but it feels like a lot of the people working hard at the time, um, you know, are still working hard today. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, I think, you know, Will would say you were the first um, to open Christie's. No, when you first came out, you actually opened the Christie's uh, in Dubai, and you were, of course, the director of Art Dubai yeah, yeah. For, for the first year. So, you know, you were all doing different things that fed into each other. Yeah, and it sort to of yeah totally. I meant community in the sense that the Al Sarkal community with a capital C that you, we hear of today. But we were, you know, we were friends, we hung out, we knew each other. Um, but it wasn't like we were all coordinating with each other. It, we would initially, the first year, every 
you know, every week there'd be an opening and then our clients were like, why don't you just open together so we can come on one night rather than I came last week, now I've got to come the next week. You know, so we were like, yeah, actually we should coordinate and just have, you know, so we started off basically coordinating the lanes. So our lane, we would open together. The lane behind us, you know, they would open in their own time. So it was, yeah, it wasn't as, uh, as coordinated as, as today. It's a much more, you know, it's a slicker operation. <laughs> and I think what struck me, um, you know, with the exhibition um, in the Wing Gallery and then um, with Tabari Art Space is, you know, we're showing um, Afra Dahari's work and she founded a space in Abu Dhabi, Beit 15, which is uh, an artist run space where her and two other artists, um, they sort of rented out an old house that used to actually belong to another artist um, and, and use it as a space to create work. And um, Afra shares the studio Beit 15 with Maitha Abdullah. And the work that we're showing, an enormous monumental rope piece, um, was actually installed in her studio space, um, together with some of the works that you'll find in Tabri Art Space um, now, if you were to go upstairs. Um, and then, of course, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Mohammed Ahmed Ibrahim um, you know, mentored some of these younger artists um, and encourages them and, and speaks with them. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Um, and so I wonder, Maya, because I know that you and actually um, Roxanne, who's just walked in, um, are together working on Expo 2020 on a wonderful pavilion um, that looks at the history of um, the sort of UAE art scene and the community around it. I wonder whether, Maya, you could tell us a bit more about that, about that sort of um, art community in, in, in terms of the artists that work together. Um, yes, I mean, Beit 15 is quite, uh, quite interesting because um, there's so much happening uh, in, in the UAE, I mean, with, from institutions and from museums, uh, universities, the, pro the, the individual programs. But Beit 15 is a studio space and an exhibition space, and it's a group of artists who came together. And we were actually having a conversation with Monira Sayer a few days ago, and she, uh, she mentioned something that was quite striking, the fact that it's the first artist collective and space that comes together after Hassan Sharif established the free atelier Mersam al-Hur in uh, 1987. So 30 years after, uh, she mentioned that this is the first artist collective with a space, a studio spaces, and exhibition spaces, they're actually a library as well. And um, that comes together uh, almost three years ago or four years ago. So, um, and for instance, uh, yes, we're showing Afra, and, uh, but we're also showing, uh, we said, um, Afra, Afra Swedi, and Afra Swedi was a student of Afra, of Afra Dahiri. So there is this mixing of, um, of these communities coming together um, and, and producing together and discussing things together. And now Beit 15 is welcoming also a fourth artist. Um, is it Zuhur Sayer? Yes. Um, which is... I mean, which is, which is fantastic because there is this alternative to the institution's initiatives that is taking place now, where artists are getting together and coming up with different uh, formats. Uh, for, for producing art and for interacting. I wonder if, um, Asma, you'd be able to tell us a bit more about um, Muhammad Ahmed Ibrahim and Hassan Sharif, um, you know, and what was happening 30 years ago. Um, um, I think they formed, um, well, they're now referred to as the five. So um, it was Hassan Sharif, Muhammad, uh, Muhammad Kadam, uh, Hussein Sharif and um, Ahmed uh, Abdullah Saadi. And um, I think they were pretty much working, sort of, they were loners in, in many ways, and they sort of came together. Um, they were involved with the Emirates Society, um, and then I know they did a show in 1995, I think it was called um, it's Emirates, Emirates Arts, or it was in the Sitar, Sitar. The Five. Uh, I think. The Five, yeah, the five. yeah, that's probably where the, the name came from. Um, and they each showed, um, you know, it was a group show of the, of the five artists. Um, so they were working, but they weren't collaborating, and everyone had their own sort of voice. They weren't, they weren't a, a collaboration or a collective. 
Um, and yeah, I think Hassan was uh, really Muhammad's uh, brother in many ways. They were very, very close. And in fact, there's a whole series of works um, that uh, Muhammad has called The Sitting Man. And that is actually a photo of Hassan Sharif that he sort of took by accident and it, it sort of had, um, you know, didn't have his whole figure, but he was sitting in that way. And Muhammad was, has been repeating that painting for, for quite some time, um, quite obsessively. Um, and, it, and it's actually Hassan Sharif. And then I think the last painting he did was once Hassan had passed away. So he stopped, he sort of closed that series. Um, so Sitting Man is uh, yeah, quite an important series and it's, it's a portrait of, of, his, of an artist, his mentor. So yeah, we had quite a close relationship. Did you want to add something to that? Oh, sorry. I thought you. <laughs> okay. I thought you. I thought I you moved your. Okay, <laughs> can ask me privately. Um, and so, you know, from what was happening 30 years ago, from this pioneering group that were working together, um, you know, the artists today, you know, they're very. I mean, I think a lot of the works are in conversation. Of course, there were some artists that you could say bridge that. I mean, you know, Sheikh El Mazrou, um, Ebtisam Abdelaziz. You could say that's a sort of second generation almost um, and then you come to the ones that are sort of really you know graduating now um, you know but what really strikes me is that um, there is this kind of art community and ecosystem and that they do sort of exchange ideas um, and you can see that in some of the works like for example Afra Dahari's works um, you know the fact that she uses rope does also recall Hassan Sharif um, and some of his works and and I think that's um, you know, that's not an accident in a way that, that, that they're working with materials, um, you know, that somehow speak out to them in, in that kind of context and landscape. Would you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. No, it's, it's definitely not an accident. I mean, you're, uh, there is one installation by um, Hassan Sharif that was shown in, uh, but we cannot see them at the NYU Abu Dhabi Gallery. And, um, and I mean, for me personally, it very much reminded me of the work that uh, Afra is showing here, but also, also, um, there is a turning point in the development of the scene in the UAE. There is, before when uh, there was this interaction uh, between artists and, uh, um, and, and the influence of Hassan Sharif without a doubt because he has a very strong influence on a number of artists. He was, he's described by artists as so generous. He would bring these uh, books and translate them and, and from, from the States, uh, from, the, from, from the UK, from the States, all, all of these um, uh, crit uh, art critique works and, uh, and conceptual uh, texts, and he would translate them. And, and, this is, and, and he will share everything, all his knowledge with his students. So, uh, but then we move to, I think around towards the end of the 2000s, where we have the universities and we have the education. We have, for instance, the SIF, uh, the Salama bin, uh, Salama bin Hamdan uh, Emerging Artist program. Fellowship Program, which is a brilliant, I mean, somebody like, uh, for instance, Afra Dahiri is a graduate of that program. A number of now of the Emirati artists that are making an impact on the scene are graduates of these, of these programs. So this, this is when this uh, art education, you feel that there is a shift where there is a different... Um, uh, there, there, there is a, there is a different converse, almost a different conversation that is happening that is as valid as, I mean, it's different, but it's still as valid as what was happening before. Um, I wanted to discuss also the the work of Afra. Yes, she is she is referring to hair as uh, when when she was when she's braiding these ropes, but there are two smaller pieces that I find really really moving because she tried to mold these uh, these ropes she put them in a mold and then in one of them she removed the mold and in the other one you feel as if the mold has broken and and for her it's also an attempt to to um, really to give a a physical dimension to memory because it's like it's like these hair as when you remove the mold, the hair is still taking the shape as if as if it's memorizing the shape. But yet it's it's like she says that after if you if you wash your hair and you sleep the following day you have this you know it takes it it takes shape. But but memory is is ephemeral, and and this is what she's really thought, How ephemeral is memory? How 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 can we? They need to record it maybe so that we can. Uh, that and make sense of it so that we can extend it and um, is, it, is it also a little bit the sort of social conditioning 
as a child. So, you know, we, we mentioned that, you know, if she went to see her grandmother, she'd have to sort of braid her hair and look presentable. And so the way you carry your hair or wear your hair um, or own your hair as such, as it's your, you know, it sort of defines how you interact with people, how you behave. It, it kind of impacts how you move around physically, um, that your hair is, you know, covered or not covered, braided or not braided. Um, and in a way, you know, with the mould, I sort of also think it makes you think that, you know, as a child, you're taught certain things. Um, you're taught to fit into a certain way. And then even when you're able to, um, you know, sort of independently push against those barriers or boundaries and sort of say, well, I might think a little bit differently, I might take away this mould, um, you still have that kind of inbuilt memory of it that slightly defines how you move, you know, as you make that new space for yourself. Um, and it takes a while to sort of detangle that or move away from that or, or shake free from that um, to sort of form a, a, a freer identity in a way or a different identity, but still, of course, valuing tradition and heritage um, at the same time. Um, I find with the mold and then the absence of the mold, it sort of makes you think of the things that you carry forward from childhood. Um, and in a way with Muhammad Ahmed Ibrahim and um, sunsets and, and sort of thinking that when he reads, you know, discovered sunsets, having having not seen them before, um, that left an imprint. Um, or with Maitha Abdullah and um, you know the rooster and, and the idea that her grandmother would tell her um, that those were the angels singing nearby, you kind of somehow want to return to that. Um, it's a sort of psychological thing. Um, at the same time as you want to move past it or move beyond it, um, which is quite an interesting connection in a way, um, you know, between the artist's works. Um, I don't know if um, you want to tell us a bit more about Maitha's practice, because I feel we've spoken a bit about Muhammad Ab Ahmed Ibrahim and, and um, the emerging artists. Um, I mean, Maitha, of course, um, does performance work. She actually um, did an amazing piece for Abu Dhabi Art last year um, for our um, Rose Lejeune curated our performance program, and she did a video work um, that was shown sort of online, which was she found a space in the desert are you familiar with um yeah i know the piece um yeah i can't remember, can't remember the title of that particular piece but i know which one you're referring to yeah um so uh, can you tell us a bit more about her performance work in in general or um yeah so recently she did a work um and it was called um it was basically to do with kind of confronting your fears head on so and her fear was sin so again she used the pig icon so she sat and had dinner with the pig because basically the idea of like if you confront your fear you can overcome it um, that's amazing. I didn't, I didn't know about that performance. Yeah, I love yeah. that. So it's a kind of a performing of identity um, that, that kind of comes out in her work. And, you know, I think also the hair piece, which is rope, in fact, um, is a sort of a performance yes. in a space. Would you agree? Yes, it's definitely a performance. And Hint, it's a performance. Uh, Hint's video is, uh, it's, it's okay. we're talking about the masculinity. Yes, she's talking about addressing uh, um, topics of masculinity, but she's also addressing the body, she's addressing um, uh, movements, uh, she's giving when, when does the body become a, a frontier between the public and the private. Um, so, um, it's a it performance is, it of is, masculinity. It is, it, it, yes, it is a performance, and also what's interesting about this work is that, and we discussed it, um, when she presented it, she presented it as an unfinished work, as a work in, pro in, in, uh, in process. Um, and she made visible how she was researching this topic. So the starting point was this disco competition. But then when you look at the, at the video, she's superposing um, other, other, other performances. She's superposing also how she is looking at the internet and she's carrying out her search. Um, and she was supposed to build on this uh, video, and she st but she didn't do it during the exhibition in, uh, in, in Abu Dhabi. But what I learned from her is that she went through several exercises where she was, she was in a group with Lawrence Abu Hamdan where she has to sit 20 minutes and hear everybody really constructively critique the work. And, and this, is, this is what's happening more and more extensively in, in these uh, uh, group in, in the UAE that you have now the, this, um, these uh, communities and artistic uh, uh, collectives that are getting together and they are, they are critiquing each other. And this is extremely important at this stage. 
And again, um, before we sort of move on from performance, I suppose with Muhammad Ahmed Ibrahim, there's this sort of repetitive visual utterance with the lines, um, which is performative in a way. I mean, he, you know, he certainly, I've seen him create some of his sort of, um, you know, public outdoor installations. And there's a lot that happens that's um, uh, sort of subliminal or subconscious. He just creates these lines, these signs. Um, can you tell us more about his signs that he, that he creates? So he has um, these symbols, it's hard to describe them. They look like rock drawings of humans. Um, and um, th he's been repeating those, I think, th for the last, I don't know, maybe 10 years or so. Um, so sometimes they'll be very small and repeated and repeated on, on paper or canvas. Uh, and, and sometimes it can be a large piece with lots of lots of little small works or now he's gone into making a painting with just one large symbol. Um, but that symbol is, is always there. Um, and uh, yeah, he's, it's just very obsessive. And then he's, he's sort of also moved on to sculptures of the, that symbol as well, um, from paper mache or um, sort of other, other medium. So it's quite a big part of his practice, but it also goes back to the land. You know, these are the kind of, um, you know, primordial drawings that you would find in caves, um, and you find them even on rocks um, that have, you know, have been there for, for many, many thousands of years, or, or have it. I'm not sure actually quite how old they are, but they're very, you know, um, his, his work is very rudimentary. He's working with paper mache, paper, cardboard, string, rock. Um, so it's kind of the opposite of the, the development that's happening in the country. You know, he's, he's keeping it on a, on a very basic um, medium, basically, I would say. So, it's, yeah, it's very tactile. And it's all made by him with his hands. He's, he works alone in the studio, but he's very prolific. He spends all day uh, making art, really. <laughs> and I j it just occurred to me, you know, one last thing about his works you're showing in the gallery. Yeah. One of them is also about bottles that were delivered to the house. And you so, so the line, so it's the actual, the, the origin of the line, because I'm like, what made you sort of want to draw a line? You know, it's either in black or in white. Um, and again, as a child, I mean, Khurfa Khan in the 60s would have been really a village and they would deliver water and they would put a mark on the walls to indicate how many bottles they had, had delivered. And then at the end of the month, you settle the account. And actually, it's quite a funny story. He was naughty and he went and he's put lines on all the walls. <laughs> and so his mum was like, you know, <laughs> got very upset with him. Um, and so it was, you know, obviously, he got a telling off. And uh, it sort of stayed in his mind. And I think he always goes back to this line. Uh, maybe it was the first time, his first mural, you know, <laughs> that he did when he was five years old. Um, but it is, it's about the environment and these are visual memories that have stayed since those times. And you see it in his work, you even see, you know, the paper mache sculptures that we have. You know, he still uses lines in them, you know, in the patterns. So you can always spot them somewhere um, in, in his work. Yeah. Well, I think I'm going to invite our audience to ask us any questions, um, if you have any, um, about the artist, since, um, you know, we've been, or we'll ask each other if you don't, <laughs> but I, I wonder if anyone wanted to ask any questions um, about any of the artists that we've spoken about um, today. Uh, collaboration with collectors as a as a yeah I mean it's it's not like a fixed program I think yeah it's it's not like every year they they work with another collection or um, so for example um, we, there was the Malehi show I think that was probably one of the last ones I saw um, and that was um, like a moving sort of museum show which started off here um, I'm, I'm not sure if there were any others with specific collectors. I think that was a one-off. It's, it's very different, yeah. Yeah, you know, like they've also had, they had a v &A show quite early on as well, but it was, I think it was a fashion, like from the fashion, a fashion designer, vintage pieces. Um, it varies, they don't, there's no fixed um, formula to what, what's going on there, yeah. <laughs> 
Atasi Foundation also had something. You might have seen that. Um, just trying to think of some of the bigger shows they've had. Um, it was a Syrian, a Syrian exhibition. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's not any fixed sort of format. Um, the space is quite tricky as well because you know it's it's not easy and um, you know for the humidity and the temperature, there's certain things that you can't really show there. So yeah. No, it wasn't intentional. It's because we started, we didn't know, I didn't know what they were going to present. So it was work that we started working on while we were um, when we were going through the uh, uh, building to the exhibition. But, um, but probably um, it's, it's why I selected these artists. There were quite, a, and it was difficult also the process of going through portfolios online because everything happened online. I wasn't able to see the work, I wasn't able to meet the artist uh, physically, so, and th thanks to Diala, Diala helped a lot, at least to, um, uh, to discuss some of the work and some of the artists. So, when, uh, the reason why um, I think I, s I was drawn to these three women artists in particular, and it wasn't in even intentional to be only women artists, but it, it's just, probably it's because, um, it probably it's because they looked at the past and probably because they, they, there's a lot of personal stories in, in the way they approach their art. And, and there's a lot of experimentation in the way. Afra Dahri was, was working extensively with material. Um, um, Hind also, Hind, it was this, this way at, of looking at her, at her environment telling the stories of Dubai. She's from Dubai. Um, and, and very much as an observer, more than an, as an artist. I mean, her, her, her art is, reflects her observations, her, her comments. So I think there was this personal element in their work that really drew me to them. And then after, it just happened that they developed their work and there was links that you could build to, to put together the exhibition. At the beginning, it was one-on-one, -on -one, uh, but we had several sessions also where we were all together, and we had sessions with Diala where we were all discussing also how, um, I mean, the direction of the conversations. Uh. It was an absolute treat. There was <laughs> literature. There was, I mean, I was yeah, getting all so these reading. references of books to read that would, that would be, because I think you brought a very literary perspective in as well. You sort of encouraged them, if they were interested in architecture, read this book. If they were interested in memory, read this book. I think that was a very important dynamic between you and them as well. Yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's always fascinating to work with, with, uh, with artists, whether emerging or more established. Uh, I guess the curator learns as much as um, the artists benefit from this, uh, from this exchange. Yes, please, hello. <laughs> That's a good question, Eva. <laughs> I asked the same question, actually, to, to Afra. For her, especially with the big piece, with Tasriha, she really wanted to reflect um, the weight of, of, of hair. Not only as, again, not only as a number on scale, but what it means to, um, to in general, to different communities. I mean, there is, hair has different connotations in different communities, but particularly for her. And... Um, um, it impacted her life, I mean, her youth, for it, uh, obviously, because she's talking about it now. But it's also at the society level, what, what does it mean? Um, um, yes, it's, uh, I think it's heavy in meaning. And she wanted that feel. Now, here you don't feel it as much as when we, sh we showed it at Abu Dhabi Art. I mean, the scale, it's six meters high in Abu Dhabi Art when it was shown. But she wanted that feel of when you go and you are overwhelmed, so it's like it's in there and you need to address it.
I think that's actually an interesting difference is the final work realized for Abu Dhabi Art was six meters tall and the work we're showing here is about three meters tall. It's a sort of study or, or preparatory, I, I mean, almost a preparatory work for the final work. Um, and yet, you know, this work is shown in quite a domestic setting because our gallery space looks like a sort of home, it looks like a room in, in an English home. Um, and then the hair becomes monumental within that space. It's, it's huge compared to the proportions of the ceilings and so on. And that actually works really well here because, you know, she mentioned that, um, you know, during lockdown she was conducting a lot of her meetings by Zoom. And, um, you know, of course she was in her inter a home space, um, you know, an intimate space at home, but she'd have to cover her hair for some of the meetings, um, you know, to sort of uh, be proper. Um, to be correct, to not sort of be showing too much hair in some of these meetings. Um, but it was a strange contradiction because she was at home where she, in theory, wouldn't have to, and yet she was doing this. And so that, I think that's kind of highlighted by this enormous monumental work here within a domestic space. You get that feeling of that kind of importance of hair in that context. Actually, she's also very playful because one of the pieces, she didn't show it, even she didn't show it in her solo at... Uh, at, uh, yes, at the Green Art Gallery. Uh, one of the pieces was her veil, and she actually printed on, on the veil a photo of her, of her hair. So when she puts the veil, you feel as if the hair is showing. So I, mean, that, I, f I felt that was so, f it's, it's, it's so playful, and it's so cheeky in a way. And, uh, and it's, in a way, it's like, you know, you're pushing the boundary. You're, you're okay, well, I can't, I'm, I'm not showing my hair, but I'm, I am as if showing my hair, so what, what's the discussion here? And the amazing thing is, you know, just from the two days where you people have been coming in to see the work, the amount of different people that can look at that work and relate to it and say, I know what it's like to spend so long taming my hair, braiding my hair, um, you know, pulling my hair back to look presentable for work, you know, putting my hair this way or that way. It, it sort of really spoke to a lot of people from, you know, from all over the world. Um, as something they could connect to, um, in particular women. Um, I, I don't know if anyone else has any other questions they wanted to ask. Oh, go on, Melissa, you've got to have one. <laughs> That's a really interesting point. Yeah, absolutely. But I think that also, like, in a, I was trying to think of where, like, the village, the, in, in some ways, it just speaks to the, the lack of infrastructure in, in Abu Dhabi that there's, there's still repurposing homes in a sense because, because even though so much is being built and there's so many, so many resources, some of the best spaces are these kind of, you know, young artists. I think there has to be both, and what you have is, uh, you know, at a leadership level, at the government level, these incredible, ins I mean, I can't think of a more beautiful museum than the Louvre Abu Dhabi, I can't think of more impactful shows than at the Sharjah Museums, I can't think of a more thriving scene, you know, I I between Sharjah, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and all of these places, but at the same time, for an art scene to be healthy, it has to also have a grassroots, it has to have artists, you know, picking up the helm and creating their own spaces and making and creating together. And that's where something like Bait 15 is so important, is it, it's also happening from the gr you know, ground up, not just sort of top down, because um, it has to be hand in hand. Yes, please. I mean, the, with the sticks, that's the Ayala dancing, which is very much... 
yes, with um, yes, I mean that absolutely. That is a, it's um, you know that is a part of of a, it's a sort of heritage. It's a cultural form. It's a cultural language, um, which is incredibly beautiful and which absolutely still exists. And I think you know the UAE is very careful to protect and preserve its culture as much as kind of adapting to a transforming urban landscape. Um, and so those things are recorded and cared for, and certainly the Department of Culture and Tourism, um, you know, which is where I work, um, there's a whole department that looks after heritage and, and makes sure these things are recorded and transcribed and noted and, and carried forward. And there's still Ayala dancers that, you know, you'd be welcome to come and see next time you come back. Um, Okay, wonderful. I think we're going to uh, end there. And I'm going to say thank you so much for staying with us and listening. And I hope you enjoy the exhibition. We'll all be in our gallery spaces up on the second floor. So you're welcome to come and explore the actual exhibitions. And I think that's the pleasure of being, you know, coming through this pandemic, as you can see work firsthand again. Um, so we, we encourage you all to come and see the works firsthand. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you Diala. Thank Thanks. You. And thank you to our panelists.